Hey guys, uh, back again, going for our second lecture in this virtual lecture series for the Wilcox County Emergency Medical Responder course. Uh, lecture two is going to be about workforce safety and wellness. It's something that just gets overlooked a lot of times by people in the uh, EMS community and it unfortunately has major consequences. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, safety and wellness goals. It's always important just to keep this in the front of your mind. Uh, your safety is always the most important thing of the day-to-day uh, -day operations, okay? So you want to use basic knowledge of the EMS system, including the information from this lecture at the scene of emergency while you're waiting for a higher level of care to get there. That just means that while you're taking care of everybody else, just think about taking care of yourself as well. That just goes a long way in the longevity of your career. All right, standard safety precautions. Uh, when you're entering the EMS profession, it's a great idea to go ahead and have a baseline health assessment. This just lets you know where you're starting at. It lets you know if any weaknesses you may or may not have. It just keeps you up to date on everything that's going on. That way you have something to measure, you know, changes of your body against in the future. You need to make sure your immunizations are up to date. Uh, we'll go over a list of recommended immunizations uh, when we go to in-person class on Wednesday. These are all things that you can obtain through your local health department. Screening for tuberculosis is uh, always recommended. It's a way that you can be tested regularly and then you can tell if you've had an exposure, if you've, you know, received an infection or something like that. It's just something good to have record of. A safe operation of patient care equipment. There's a lot of different pieces of equipment that we're going to use, you know, throughout this class. And we're going to get familiar with them and you're going to need to be able to use them in the EMS system. And it's very important to be able to use them effectively. You're also going to be aware in your environment. You're working in an ever-changing environment. Things are always active. Things are always evolving. And they can evolve into some really dangerous situations if you don't keep your head on a swivel and know what's going on. All right, personal protective equipment. Um, personal pr protective equipment is also referred to as PPE. And that's how we'll refer to it mostly in this class. Um, it protects you from you know anything in the environment or from a patient that may you know come in contact with your body. All right, so exposure to diseases spread through blood or bodily fluids or by respiratory droplets are best prevented by the use of standard precautions, and that's uh, you know using standard you know personal protective equipment. Hand hygiene is probably the single most important. Uh, thing you can do to prevent the spread of infection it's so important and it's neglected by so many people I'm guilty of it myself work in an environment where you don't always have access to soap and water but when you don't have access to soap and water it's just important to go ahead and use hand sanitizer it's very effective it's been shown to you know kill 99% of you know drums germs or you know viruses so it's, it's very effective you just got to be stay on top of it be very prudent uh, you need to wash your hands after your gloves are removed. Even if you're wearing gloves, you still need to wash your hands. It's super important. As so always, use soap and water and just follow the recommended guidelines for, uh, you know, length of time and the process for actually washing your hands. Like I said a minute ago, if you don't have access to soap and water, you need to be able to use alcohol-based hand rub. The proper way to use alcohol-based hand rub is to put it on your hands and rub it into your hands and all the crevices until your hands are dry if you don't do that you're you're not really you're not using it to its full you know level of effectiveness uh, cleanse hands uh, and other exposed skin immediately if they're exposed uh, to a contaminant such as blood or bodily fluids or you know after using the toilet or touching anything dirty um, I'm sure you guys can see I made an error in this slide sorry about that I've been really rushing trying to get all this stuff put together so you guys could study so <laughs> try to do better on the next one 
All right, so gloves. You always want to wear your gloves for patient contacts where there's a risk of exposure to blood or bodily fluids. Most of the time, you know, on calls that you run into, there's always potential for some type of exposure. And the best way to look at it is everybody, you know, is a potential um, source of an exposure and you just got to keep that in the back of your mind if you and if you use caution on every patient you, you're not going to have that many problems uh, and when you do come in contact with the patient that is that you know has a certain virus or has a pathogen you're always wearing the same PPE and it's not a big deal you just continue to do your job as you've done for the previous thousand patients that did not have any type of uh you know, risk of infection. If you have a latex allergy, allergy, there are multiple different types of gloves on the market these days. Most uh, EMS services are moving to more of a nitrile type glove. It's non-latex, so you don't have to worry about the latex allergy for the provider or the patient. They're great gloves. I'm not sure what Wilcox uses. I'm, I'm sure they use nitrile gloves as well. Right, eye protection or face shield, uh, especially these days with COVID-19 being out there and all the CDC guidelines, stuff. So face protection has uh, come to a forefront. I spent the last decade of my career rarely wearing face or you know eye protection on general calls. However, now our procedures have changed, and that's something that's always going to evolve. Uh, the main times you're going to want to use these things are if there's a major risk of splash or spray of blood or bodily fluids. Uh, it reduces the risk of contamination of the mucous membranes, mostly the eyes, nose, and mouth. And like I said, you always want to use the eye protection on patients that are bleeding profusely, you know, or maybe they're delivering a baby. And there's just a lot of fluids involved in that. I'm sure you ladies are aware of that and the guys are probably hoping they never have to deliver a baby in the field but it'll probably happen at some point if you do this long enough all right so masks um there's different levels of uh protection that the masks offer uh, as a general rule at the emr level it's a good idea just to say that you're going to wear n95 mask and you're going to put a surgical mask on the patient. Uh, the surgical mask that you put on a patient protects from dropper precautions. Uh, not to get too technical here, but a surgical mask will protect from anything larger than a six micron particle. It's pretty small. It will really cover anything other than a actual airborne pathogen, which there are very few of, you know, that we deal with today. Uh, the N95 is a higher level of protection than most calls require but it's always good practice to you know just step it up a notch when you're you know talking about protecting yourself so always look for n95 for yourself and a surgical mask for the patient i'll bring some examples of both of those to class on wednesday all right gowns gowns are uh you know a article of clothing that just covers your entire body you know your uniform your street clothes or whatever you may have on they're effective in situations with large amounts of blood or bodily fluids. Again, childbirth, um, somebody with arterial bleed, somebody that's, you know, vomiting, got major diarrhea. I mean, you know, like it or not, these patients still have to be cared for and you have to treat them the same way you treat anybody else. You just have to protect yourself in a different way. So if your PPE fails and your clothing does become contaminated, you need to remove your clothing ASAP. Um, you know, as soon as you can get to a safe, reasonable area to get your clothes off, go ahead and get them removed. Uh, you need to take a shower as soon as you possibly can. I'm sure a lot of the fire departments have showers that you're, you can use. You don't want to, you know, go home and shower necessarily, bring, you know, possible pathogens home to your family. Uh, that goes the same for your clothes. If you can uh, wash your clothes, you know, in a different washing machine than you use for the rest of your family's clothes, or you can wash them, you know, at the very least in a different load than you would 
be washing the rest of your clothes in. So let's talk about exposure real quick. Exposure is something that you're inevitably going to have to deal with at some point in your career. What if your PPE fails and you're exposed to a pathogen or other harmful subject, subject, uh, sorry, substance? The first step is always going to be to clean the contaminated area uh, with soap and water. Uh, soap and water is great. It's underrated. It kills almost everything. Uh, if your eyes are involved, flush with water for 20 minutes. Uh, a lot of Fire departments have commercial eye flush stations. They sell them that you can hook up to water hoses. I mean, they're uh, very useful and make it a lot easier to flush your eyes than just flushing it with, you know, standard household appliances. Uh, report the exposure to EMS providers when they arrive on scene. They'll probably be able to give you a lot more insight and get you up to speed on what you need to do next. They've been dealing with this day in, day out, and they can give you some good advice. Uh, you need to report the exposure to the appropriate individuals in your department. That may be your captain, may be your chief, it just depends on the uh, structure of your particular department. And if you are a you know, private citizen that happens to be responding or happen to be on scene, you just need to seek, uh, seek medical care with your primary care physician. Uh, you also need to document the incident. You need to write down the time, the circumstances, what happened, and then you also need to write up the actions that were taken just to protect yourself and keep documented the event. All right, so stress management, that goes more into our uh, mental health. That's can't be overstated. You've got you to gotta take care of yourself mentally to be able to do this job. After you know years, it'll affect it'll affect you whether you realize it or not. Um, so you gotta gotta manage your stress. So as a EMR, you're gonna find yourself in highly stressful or dangerous situations on a regular basis. Some of the situations may include critically ill or injured patients, dead or dying patients, overwhelming sights, smells, and sounds, multiple patient situations. Angry or upset patients, family members. It's your job to remain calm and supportive during the event. If you're on a scene and you're panicking, everything's going crazy, everybody else is going to start panicking. You are the person there that's trained to handle this situation, and if you can remain calm, for the most part, everybody else will remain calm at least to a level that is manageable you can't lose it or everybody else is going to just follow you you got to be cool even if you're freaking out on the inside all right so during and immediately after a stressful event um during the event i mean you just have to be able to administer appropriate care you've got to be able to do what you got going on um you got to be able to work with the other personnel on scene you got to be calm, supportive, and non-judgmental. You have to allow patients to express their feelings as long as it doesn't cause harm to others. If what they're doing is going to hurt you, by all means, you need to remove yourself from the situation, or you know, you need to stop them from, you know, continuing the behavior that they are. You know, you've got to keep yourself safe, for lack of better words. But you got to also let them express themselves as long as it's not affecting anybody directly. So, after you've been exposed to stress for over an extended period of time, what are some warning signs? A lot of people are going to have difficulty sleeping or nightmares. This may be recurring, maybe every night. You may become more irritable. Uh, this could be subtle. You may have your family telling you, Dad, I don't know why you're being so irritable. I don't. I, I just, you know, I didn't really do anything, and you're just being mean. You need to be very aware of these things because they can sneak up on you. You can feel sad, anxious, or you know, feel some guilt from somebody that you felt like you maybe could have done something more for, and the outcome wasn't the best. 
you feel indecisive, you may second guess yourself. You may uh, look back at a situation or a call that you ran and know that it didn't go as well as it could. And going forward, you may have a hard time making decisions. You may lose your appetite, just not be hungry. You may not be interested in sex as you were, you know, previously. You might just feel isolated. Uh, You see things that you may not be able to just talk to your family about. They may not understand. And sometimes you're just going to feel alone and you just need to be able to reach out to somebody and talk to you. A lot of times your coworkers, your fellow uh, brothers and sisters at the fire department are great resources because they know what you're going through because they go through it themselves. You may lose interest in work. You may just get burned out. You may get tired of seeing the, you know, terrible things that you see that put you that way and you just... You're just not interested anymore, and you know you just have to work through it and talk about it and move move forward. Uh, you may have some physical symptoms. You could feel hopeless and just like nothing's gonna ever get better. And you, you just you may feel trapped. A lot of times, this leads into drug and alcohol abuse and just the general inability to concentrate. How can you manage stress? Uh, different people manage stress in different ways, but some general things, general ways to manage your stress are to talk about your feelings. I mentioned uh, previously that sometimes it's hard to talk to your family about it. You can talk to your coworkers, you know, other members of the fire department, EMS, public safety. They go through a lot of the same things you're going through. Sometimes you can relate, and it helps out. You can speak with a professional mental health counselor. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having an issue that you need professional help for a lot of people you know feel like it's a weakness it's not uh you have to take care of yourself you can also make lifestyle changes that can reduce stress Uh, again i got a typo guys i'm sorry about that uh you can change your diet you can exercise a little bit more you can limit alcohol and caffeine intake or you can uh, use different relaxation techniques we'll go over some more of that stuff in the class All right. How do you deal with death and dying? Um, this is something that's unique to public safety and military, you know, and, and different professions that just happen to come in contact with death and dying more frequently than the general population. Uh, when you're actually on scene. You always want to try to attempt to resuscitate the patients without a pulse unless there's a valid DNR, which is a do not resuscitate order on scene. There's obvious signs of death such as tissue decay or rigor mortis. Um, or if attempting to resuscitation would, end, uh, would endanger your life. You Again, you've got to put your personal safety ahead of everything else. So the family members are your patients just as much as your uh, patient is if it's involving death or dying. Response to death and dying is different for everybody. The general steps of the grieving process are as follows. Now keep in mind everybody doesn't go through every step of this process and some people don't go in the same order. But the general steps are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Alright, prevention of response related injuries. Um, As part of the emergency team, you're going to be put in situations that are dangerous on a daily basis. It's easier to prevent an injury in the first place than to have to deal with it later. So just always be aware of that. Always wear your proper personal protective equipment. Always I know your limitations and call for more resources when you need them. There's no need to do something that's unsafe just just because you don't want to call for help. It's just not responsible. All right, so expect exposure to infectious disease. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can you know be exposed to infectious disease. Some are related to work and others aren't. Um, infectious disease per the public health 
department are generally spread through the air as airborne or droplets uh, through direct contact with blood or bodily fluids through uh, needle sticks with contaminated needles uh, contaminated food or sexual activity what do we consider an exposure alright so we consider contact with blood or bodily fluid of a person with an infectious disease and exposure uh, examples of this would be a patient gets uh, a patient's blood gets into a cut or open wound on your body you're stuck with a dirty needle that would be a needle that was used previously on uh, the patient you're dealing with now uh, bloody saliva gets in your nose or mouth these are your mucous membranes and you know disease can be transmitted through them fairly easily close contact with a patient with an airborne disease um, so airborne disease is a little different than uh, somebody that's passing droplets through the air. For all practical purposes in this class, we're going to treat them the same. We can go over some, you know, specifics in the classroom. But airborne diseases versus diseases with droplet precautions are just different. All right, how can we prevent injury? All right, so before we ever get on the call, there's a few things that we can do to prevent the injury. That would be, you know, making sure you get plenty of sleep. You want your mind to be functioning appropriately, and sleep is the best way to make sure that everything's working like it should. You need to have adequate nutrition. I'm not saying everybody needs to have their meals planned out for every uh, meal of every day, but just use a little common sense. Don't eat as much junk food. Just try to maintain you know a healthy diet uh, incorporate a little bit of fitness into your life it doesn't mean you have to go to the gym every day and lift weights and spend two hours a day at the gym but walking for 15 minutes in the afternoons or you know jogging and doing some body weight exercises at home can go a long way in preventing injuries in the future so while you're uh, actively responding to a scene or on a call uh, you've got to remain safe also. you got to keep this uh, in mind, especially with motor vehicle collisions. you got to look for other traffic hazards when you're on scene in a motor vehicle accident. you got to check and see if the airbags have been deployed and if they're at risk for deploying again. You guys at the fire department are aware of this. That's why we disconnect the power of the battery You know, prior to starting extrication most of the time. You've got uh, power lines that could be issues. I mean, you always got to look for these overhead obstructions. Uh, vehicle stability. The vehicle may not be in gear, in park. It may still be in gear. It may be running. Uh, you never want to try to start extricating anybody until you've got that vehicle stable where it's not going to go anywhere. Fire is always a um, major threat in motor vehicle accidents. You've got a lot of fluids, a lot of flammable fluids encountering high heat that's just a recipe for fire I mean it's just basic knowledge you just got to keep that in mind it can occur at any time it can cause some major problems now, so you've also got to be aware of hazardous materials it's very important to keep in mind that hazardous materials are everywhere they're on the streets going downtown they're in trucks they're in stores they're in people's homes they're everywhere um, Generally, when they're being transported, it's going to be labeled. You're going to be able to know what's going on by placards and stuff like that. So when you arrive on scene at a suspected incident involving hazardous materials, you should always be looking for those placards that can help you identify the substance and notify dispatch so they can alert the other members of the emergency team that are coming there. Uh, just because you may have gotten too close to a hazardous material doesn't mean everybody that's responding to the call needs to have the same exposure. We try to limit that as much as possible, and you can do that by relaying the information through dispatch. So lifting and moving. Uh, this is something you always got to keep in mind. That's where most of the injuries occur as far as... Um, you know EMS goes is always lifting and moving people people are never in good positions and it seems like they're always bigger than we would like them to be 
So you always got to use good body mechanics. A uh, few pointers for good body mechanics are always keeping your back straight. Maintain a good firm grip on whatever it is you're lifting. Don't twist your body when you're lifting. Uh, maintain a firm footing with a good stance. Communicate your next move clearly with your partner. And keep good posture. And You've got to know your limits. If they're too big, they're in an awkward position, call for more help. Don't try to move them unless you have enough help. Let's talk about emergency moves. When do we use emergency moves? Alright, so the only time we're going to use emergency moves is if the patient is in an immediately life-threatening situation. This could be fire or danger of fire. Be if they're in a close proximity to explosives or other threatening hazards. Uh, maybe we need to move them to gain access to others who need life-saving care. Or if it's a cardiac arrest victim. What are some types of emergency drags? You've got a clothing drag, a blanket drag, a firefighter's drag, and a firefighter's carry. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. We're going to go into them in great detail in the uh, lecture following this one. So just keep in mind that those are some types of emergency moves that we're going to be doing. So what is an urgent move? An urgent move is... Uh, a move where you've got a patient that may be in a life-threatening situation such as uh, they're too close to traffic, they're outside in the heat, they're somewhere that they need to get out of, they're not in an immediately life-threatening situation, but you need to get them out of there kind of quickly. So when do we use these moves? Uh, maybe if the patient's got altered mental status, the patient displays signs of inadequate breathing or shock, or the patient's in a, just a potentially dangerous situation like we talked about. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Uh, the patient's in a potentially dangerous situation, you know, like we talked about earlier, that they need to get out of. So what are some examples of urgent moves? Uh, so you've got a direct ground lift or an emergency extremity lift. Uh, again, these are things we're going to go over in a later uh, section, so we're not going to go into much detail about it right now. All right, how do we position our patients? Uh, the biggest thing we always want to do is try to keep our patient in a position of comfort. Um, it's not always something we can do, but it should always be our goal. You work in an ever-changing environment, you just must constantly adapt. But the appropriate patient, the appropriate position to put your patient in is whatever position they need to be in that best fits the environment. We're going to go over this more in a later chapter as well. All right, the use of restraints, that's something that I try to avoid as much as possible. Uh, sometimes you just can't avoid it. Sometimes the patient's going to put themselves or others at risk and you're just going to have to restrain them. It's, it's an unfortunate thing. The biggest thing to do is just to make sure you treat the patient with respect and only use the amount of force that you have to use to get them under control. All right. Um, like I said before, the only time you want to use it if they're a threat to themselves or others you need to enlist the assistance of police if possible. These guys are trained a lot more thoroughly in the restraint of individuals and they're an invaluable resource to have on a scene when you're dealing with that. Sometimes you need to contact medical direction. Other times it's written in your protocols. I'm not sure how Wilcox County's protocols uh, go for that, but at the end of the day, you've just got to follow your protocols. If the restraints have to be used, make sure you get plenty of people there. Uh, if you don't have enough people, it could go sideways really quickly and it just can cause injury that's not necessary. You need to make a plan with other responders. Only use the amount of force necessary uh, to get the patient under control. Once you've made this decision, 
you've got to follow through. You can't go halfway. You've got to make the decision. You've got to do it. You've got to do it quickly. You need to communicate with the patient the entire time. You need to have somebody telling them what's going on. Even if they're screaming and yelling, you need to have somebody telling them what's going on. Uh, you might want to consider putting some additional oxygen on them. They're going to be upset. They're going to be using a lot of oxygen. It's not going to hurt anything to add a little bit more to them. Reassess airway, breathing, and circulation frequently. Uh, anytime you restrain somebody, they immediately become critical patient. Uh, just based on them being restrained, always keep a close eye on those ABCs. You, you don't want things to go south on you. Just, again, avoid unnecessary force. Just use the amount of force you have to use to get everything under control. All right, so in summary, uh, let's talk about this. Stress is a normal part of the EMR's life. The five stages of the grieving process when dealing with death and dying are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Stress management consists of recognizing, preventing, and reducing critical incident stress. You should understand how bloodborne and airborne pathogens are spread and attempt to prevent exposure. As you arrive on scene of a motor vehicle collision or illness, I'm sorry, that should say as you arrive on scene of a illness or injury, excuse the uh, error again, you must assess the scene for hazards including traffic, crime, crowds, and stable objects, sharp objects, <clears throat> electrical problems, fire, hazardous materials, special rescue situations, and infectious disease exposure. Alright guys, that concludes this uh, lecture. Hope you guys were able to follow it pretty well, and I'll see you on the next one.